Dearly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to get into your word and learn about these different stories of uh, these different people. And I pray as we enter into this that we would uh, just hear from your Holy Spirit. We would hear from from your wisdom, Lord. It's not about us or what uh, what we know or, or what we even want to. Um, what we want to think about you. Lord, you teach us about yourself. You teach us about your character. You teach us about your plan and, and, and what you want to teach us. And so, Father, I pray that the word would speak to us loudly and clearly today. And so as we go through this lesson, as we go through these next lessons over these, over these many weeks, uh, Lord, I pray that this would impact us in a, way, in a way that would help us to interact with our world uh, in a way more like Jesus. And so, again, ha- have our focus be on Jesus on Christ, on, on the cross, that in all these things uh, we would be giving you praise, honor, and glory. We love you, we thank you, and in Jesus we pray. Amen. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, today's, today's lesson is, is more of an intro uh, to this series. This, I, planned, I planned this out to be about a 10-week series. Uh, so having, having today be more of an intro lesson uh, and then the next three weeks after the the next three lessons after this will be over the story of Ruth, and then the three um, and then we'll have three more lessons after that about Queen Esther, um, and then we're gonna have kind of three more weeks after that uh, just over various other various women uh, in the Bible. And so having it be a ten week course, uh, we'll we'll see how we'll see how it actually works out, how it pans out. Uh, but I did want to focus primarily on Ruth and on. Queen Esther, and and again, just as more of an intro to why why are we even you know doing a Bible study series on this topic on women of the Bible, uh, and so for a little bit of background about myself and the reason why I want to do this, um, it actually was from you know Pastor Esther's suggestion that we go over the story of Ruth. Um, I believe I believe it was the story of Ruth. I, I don't think she I don't think she said you know Pastor Esther said we should do a Bible study over Esther. Um, but I think I think it was Pastor Esther who who suggested we do over the story of Ruth, and I really thought, you know, let's go over let's go over not just Ruth, but let's go over all these different women. Uh, in back in college, I I took a course from the University of Texas, a secular school, a public school. I took a course over the women of the Hebrew Bible. And I remember going in that course and it was taught by a very staunch feminist. Uh, she was, I mean, she was awesome. I loved her. She was, she was a great professor. Uh, she was wonderful. But she, she was a, um, a feminist who wanted to teach us about the Bible. Uh, and again, I was a Christian. I was a believer. I wasn't in seminary trains. I was, I was just an undergrad. Uh, and I remember going into that class every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we would have you know an hour long lecture about these various women of the Bible, and what I appreciated uh, from her that I hope to convey to you as well um, isn't the feminist aspect. I'm I'm not I'm not you know I wouldn't call myself a feminist in that way, um, but what I, what I what I gained from that class, um, even though it was taught in a secular school, was was something that we're, we'll talk about today, but it was kind of that the Bible isn't as misogynistic. The Bible isn't as sexist uh, as, as kind of the way, the way that it's perceived. Uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that anyone is sexist or that any group of people are sexist. Again, I'm not, I'm not here to, to point fingers at anyone. But I think for myself, even going through the concepts of the Bible, the concepts of uh, these depictions of these women, um, the question I always had was, man, are women second-class citizens? Are women, are women a lesser being, a weaker being? And I, you know, I, this is something that I was struggling with a lot, uh, especially even at that time as I was an undergrad, because uh, going to you know a church where it was like there there is no 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 women are allowed on leadership you know women are not allowed to teach women are not allowed to be the pastor uh, by any means women aren't allowed to preach uh, and I'm not again I'm not trying to get too deeply into uh, the theological aspects of of the New Testament yet we'll we'll get to it uh, I I I don't want to jump. Uh, jump the gun on on that just yet but what i want to do first is as we as we kind of camp out in the old testament i first and foremost want us to understand the importance of understanding 
the way the Bible portrays women in the Bible. That the, when we look at these stories of women in the Bible, it will impact the way that we interact with women today. The way we interact with the, the differences between the genders in our world today. Uh, I, want, I want something, hopefully by the end of this lesson, I want to show you that the way that women are portrayed in the Bible isn't as antiquated, isn't as backward as many people think. That actually the Bible is perhaps one of the most progressive documents, progressive texts in regards to women. That women are, are seen as being strong, that they're seen as being influential, that they're seen as being faithful, uh, that it's not, it is not a text that bashes women. It is not a text that, that degrades women. If anything, what the Bible and the characters of the Bible show is the importance of womanhood, the importance of embracing women as equal individuals, as equal creations of God. That yes, there are differences, and, and this is a very important distinction, that there are differences between men and women, that there is a different interaction, there are different physiological as well as uh, just, just different attributes that women have that men do not have, one primarily being childbearing, uh, one primarily being the ability to have children, and yet there is an equality. There is a moral equality as well as a spiritual equality between both men and women. And so uh, just kind of just again, this, just remember this, this whole um, this lesson is an introduction to the rest of the series. Uh, what I'm hoping is that this whets your appetite, that this lesson will get you to be interested even in this topic. Because I, I know um, that, th that some of us, that there are some people that probably think, um, okay, my pastor is doing a, a lesson on the women of the Bible. I'm a man, so I can skip it. Or, uh, you know what, I don't want to go over this topic because it's uninteresting to me. I hope that after this lesson that you um, kind of have a better appreciation even for this topic. Okay, so first off, we have, oh, one second. Um, three, one, four. Okay, so why study about women in the Bible? Okay, so one of the things that's really important to understand is whether or not, uh, whether or not you, you want to study about women in the Bible, the, the, the fact of the matter remains is that our culture, the American, the Judeo-Christian American culture in regards to how we treat women or how women have been treated has been profoundly impacted by Bible stories, have been profoundly impacted uh, by what the Bible says. And so again, I'm, whether you are a raging feminist or you, are, um, you, you believe in egalitarianism, which is, is that men and women can hold the same roles, can hold the same titles, or whether you're more complementarian in, in, in the idea that men and women should hold different roles, uh, this idea that complementarianism... Uh, that that men are the leaders, men are the ones who are the the head, who are uh, the only ones who who should teach, the only ones who should uh, be on the pulpit and things like that. So regardless of whatever camp you lie in, in terms of um, the the role of women, not only in the church but in the world, one of the first the reasons why we study about women in the Bible is because we understand and recognize that our perception of women has been shaped by the way that they're portrayed in these stories. And more importantly than just the stories themselves, th that our understanding of women has been portrayed and impacted by the way these stories have been interpreted. And so just to clarify on this, a few questions uh, just for you to, to ponder. Uh, the first one is perhaps the most important question is that was Eve really the terrible temptress? And, and I, I say that, um, I ask this question for you, to, for you to obviously answer no, like she wasn't this terrible temptress. Uh, you know, her and Adam and Eve both betrayed God, both uh, defied his orders. But the reason why I even asked the question the way I do, was Eve really the terrible temptress, um, you know, hoping that you would say, oh, no, she wasn't, is because that's how she's been portrayed. And, and again, 
This isn't about the idea that, you know, our church hasn't taught it that way or you grew up in a church that didn't teach that way. So, you know, why why am I even saying that that's how she's been portrayed is because even the way popular culture, even the way that Eve has been seen, has been seen throughout kind of modern history and not even just modern, just church history is, is that a lot of blame regarding original sin has fallen on the shoulders of of Eve and it's Eve's fault and again this is what we wrestle with as we go through these stories was was it Eve's fault was it Eve's fault that Adam and Eve ate of the tree of garden of good and the tree of knowledge of good and evil was it her fault was she the originator of sin and, and this is really what's going to going to begin the conversation or begin the dialogue and the, the thought process of what it means to be a woman during this time period of what the relationship between men and women really are. Without jumping the gun again, I hope you know it was partially Eve's fault, but it was also Adam's fault. That the, the burden of this original sin was a human sin. It was humanity that sinned, not just Eve that tempted Adam. Uh, the, the, the danger of this is that even in, in our culture today, many times when um, there is a sexual sin of a, of a sexual nature, what we like to do many times um, without even realizing it sometimes, is that we place the blame on the temptress. We place the blame of the sexual sin or of, of just a sin of carnality. And we say, oh, it was the woman's fault. The woman is the one who tempted the man and the man had no ability to deny deny the, 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 the this evil temptress. And so really the burden of weight of responsibility falls primarily on the woman for being the temptress. And the man is just this bystander. He's just this, this casualty uh, for the trappings of this, of this woman. And so the, and then the second question I have uh, for us is, was Ruth this sweet submissive girl that is depicted in children's stories? And, and, and this is something that I, I hope we wrestle with a little bit. Uh, Ruth, Ruth, at least in terms of the Bible stories and these children's stories talking about Ruth, she seems like this just really passive, this really submissive, this really like, wow, man, Ruth was the perfect woman. She is this, this amazing subservient. She's quiet. She's, she's humble. She is just this amazing depiction of what a woman is. I hope, I hope that as, as we see, as we read the book of Ruth, we see that she is not just this sweet, submissive girl, but she is this active, this go-getter, this faithful, this, this woman of incredible faith, of incredible action with her faith, that her faith wasn't just, oh, I'm Ruth. And I'm just going to do whatever, whatever needs to be done. And I'll just be sweet and I'll be submissive. That No, she was like, let's go. Let's do this. And, and let's make sure that, that we are able uh, to work really hard to, to do what needs to get done. She was industrious. So again, I hope, I hope as we wrestle with these depictions of, of these various characters, uh, that, we, that we understand and we recognize that maybe we've interpreted it. A little a little differently and finally just to ask yourself this question of what is the difference between submission and subordinate I, I think this is perhaps one of the other things that we have um, misinterpreted when we talk about when we talk about these stories and I think the, the, the line is very blurry between submission and subordinate and so I hope that as we go through these stories that we see that there is a benefit to being submissive, but there isn't this subordinate nature. That being subordinate isn't isn't something necessarily valued for women to be during this time period. So. As we go through this study, as we read these uh, various books, uh, if you went through the Revelation Bible study with us uh, when we were going over this, the 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 study over the book of Revelation, you know that uh, we kind of took four different interpretive uh, interpretive routes. Uh, in this study, we're going to take one interpretive route. We're, we're basically going to privilege the perspective of the woman character. That whatever story we're reading, that instead of looking through the lens of a neutral party or even the perspective of the male characters, what I want to do is to look at it through the 
bias of the woman character. And and this isn't to uh, go full feminist and, and say, okay, the Bible needs to be read through the lens of a woman to be understood. No, uh, I think so often we, we read, we read the Bible through the lens of the male figures. Uh, we read through the biases and the assumptions of the male characters. And what ends up happening when we do that is as, is we silence the women characters. And so let me, let me kind of explain that a, a little bit more uh, by going through the historical status of women in ancient Israel. And so what's really important in understanding the culture of ancient Israel, the culture of the basis of our Bible, is, is that the he Hebrew society was based on the family. The family unit was so important. And this isn't to say that the family unit isn't important today in our modern, modern culture, but the way in which life was understood in Hebrew society was based around the family. It was based around your family unit and the family unit was led, was headed by the father. Again, this is a very culturally specific um, understanding of what the family is. Uh, in, t in today's culture, if someone was was talking about the American culture and what the, the American society is based upon, I would say my argument would be that the American society is based on the individual and the desires of the individual. So when we talk about the Hebrew society being based on the family, um, it, it, you have to understand it from the, the, the lens of their culture. When they thought about success, when they thought about happiness, when they thought about joy and they thought about the good things in life, it dealt with what is happy for the family, what is good for the family, what is going to be successful for the family. And their family unit wasn't even just their nuclear family. It wasn't just the mother and the father and the children. It, it many times included, it many times included, you know, the grandparents who were too old, or you know, the, the people who were about to die. That they were a part of the family. But this entire family, you know, regardless of how big it may be, was led by the patriarch, the father. And so we see this throughout the Bible that these fathers have a lot of importance. They have a lot of power that what they say goes. And so what it's important to understand this understanding, this basic unit of society, because when we read these stories, just understand that's how culture was for them. That culture is temporary. Culture is plastic. The stories are in that plastic culture, that malleable culture, the moral of the story or the truth or the theological implications are permanent. And so regardless of the plastic culture that, that can change, uh, the, the culture isn't perfect. But the theological understanding that we see within that culture is perfect. It is permanent. This is really important for us to see, not just in this study, but in all of our readings of the Bible, is to understand that, hey, maybe their culture wasn't so good. <laughs> really, maybe their culture wasn't so perfect. And so we don't want to take their cultural norms and make it our cultural norms. We want to take the truth that we find within that context and make it our own. So one of the important things that we understand is that it, it regards laws. So most of the laws that we find in this time period of ancient Israel were written to and for males, were written to and for men. So for, for example, you shall not cover your, covet your neighbor's wife. This is written, it's clearly not written towards women. Uh, again, this, this commandment, you know, one of the Ten Commandments was written for the men of the society. This wasn't, you shall not cover, covet your neighbor's wife or husband. This wasn't, this wasn't men, you know, it wasn't something specific, explicitly said that it also means that you don't covet a, a, a husband. The reason why is because women, women were not culturally in that position. That it was, it was during this time period where women were kind of that subclass, that, that second class citizen in, in, in ways that, you know, it was, they were under the protection of their husband and, and economically speaking, socially speaking, they were under his, his guidance, his leadership. And so even, even that kind of law is directed towards men. Does that mean that women do not need to follow, do not need to follow this commandment that as a woman, that women in the church today, uh, that really you only have nine commandments instead of 10. 
uh Maybe that may, maybe that maybe that's something that you do like, and maybe that's something that 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 would be nice. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm a, I'm a woman, so I I really only need to follow the nine commandments because one of the commandments says you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. The 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 point I'm trying to make isn't that no women can say they only need to follow nine instead of ten. The point I'm trying to make is is that we reinterpret that law. That it is, there is a truth that's in there, but the way that it's being presented to the people of that time is directed towards men, but it is also applicable to women. Women should also not covet. It's not just their neighbor's wife. Women shouldn't covet the possessions of others. There are also other laws, and, and uh, the other example that I want to give is the law regarding circumcision. Um circumcision is not something that that women should ever even consider that's not something that uh, you know again uh, some of these like crazy tribes um that you hear about these very primitive tribes they they force um circumcision on on young women uh which again is just a terrible thing um and i don't need to go too deep into that but again it's just a total misreading of 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 even what circumcision was in the old testament it's not something that is is done unto unto women it's something that is done uh to 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 the men to the males and it doesn't put the males on a higher level it doesn't put them of a higher importance it was just a specific law uh, to denote kind of their their faithfulness their faithfulness unto god it wasn't meant uh, for women it was meant for the men so these laws were intended to govern a group of warriors who were in battles and again this is where i think a lot of the context i want to give to us regarding the hebrews regarding the the, the israelites is so important. The the early the early Israelites, they were this nomadic group of people who fought a lot of battles. Who they went into from city to city and we see this in the book of Joshua. We see this in the book of Judges. They go from place to place and they they wage battle and they they are fighting and they are this this group of fighters and warriors who who are trying just their best to follow God but also to defeat their enemies. That is their context. That is how they're reading. Uh, that is how they're understanding the law of God. As Moses is leading these group of people, as, as Joshua is leading this group of people, we have to understand their context is as a group of warriors, as a group of soldiers, a group of people who are fighting constantly. And so the way that they have um, understood the relationship between men and women is, is, is something that, again, we're going to wrestle with, but primarily generally speaking the men were the ones who went to war and the women were the ones who took care of the family again the family unit is very important the family unit is the way that they're thinking but the the way that you benefit the family unit is by allowing the man who is physically capable of fighting who it, it is it is culturally accepted for him to fight and then the women take care of the home what we see in the Bible, I, I, want, I want you to be very clear. The Bible isn't saying that only men can fight. The Bible isn't saying that only men can defend their families. We see a very interesting depiction of a woman fighting in Deborah and, and this other woman named Jael. Um, and, and we see this in the book of Judges, and we'll get to that later, uh, probably in the, in the last the last uh, quarter, the last third of, of this Bible study, but we see these women in battle, and it's, so it's it's fascinating to me um, that it's not as if the women were told, "Oh, you're a woman, you can't fight." And I think this is again another misconception about women in the Hebrew Bible. Um, their context again is very malleable. It wasn't saying that women are not allowed to fight. Women are not allowed to be aggressive in that way or to, to defend their land or to do the, 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 the fighting for the Lord. It was just the general, generality of their culture that women usually just stayed at home. So the woman's primarily, primary responsibility in this Hebrew culture was to bear children for her husband. And so these Hebrews, because the fact that they were this nomadic and yet agrarian society... And in the early years of the community, the most valuable resource that you could have was children. And if you could have a lot of children, that was a resource that was valued uh, 
immensely like it was it was the joy it was the pride of your family if your mother was able to have 12 children if your mother ha was able to have 12 children or uh, you know a dozen kids right if she was able to have this incredible amount of children she was doing her duty to help the family to help the family unit if she had one child it, it's like all right come on lady like let's get on it like let's get on it you need to have more kids not because not because it was it was better to have a lot of kids I, just because socially is acceptable but more practically speaking the more kids you had the the better chance of survival your family unit had and i think this is where we misread it again um just just naturally speaking when we read the bible um in our culture today you know i have two kids and i i don't i don't want any more i don't i, I again the older generation tells me over and over again, you need to have more kids. You need to have at least three kids. You need to have maybe four kids. And I'm kind of like, that's too many kids. Because why? We don't live in a in agrarian society. We don't live in a society that needs more hands to work the fields, more hands to you know fight in these battles. We don't need that many children. Does Okay, again, does it mean that biblically speaking, you are required to have a dozen children that if you are a Christian, um, because the Bible values childbearing, that you need to have a lot of kids. No, that was something that was valued in their culture, in their context. And perhaps it was valued uh, in, in, a, in a culture or context that was close to us. And maybe even in the future, maybe it's going to be really good to have 10 kids. But is that something theological? Is that something that we're going to say, okay, God is saying, demands that you have many kids. So again, this is another another story we're probably going to go over uh, in, in uh, the relationship or at least the character of Leah. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about Leah and Rachel and we're going to talk about just the differences between how God blessed them. And, and we'll see uh, God blessed Leah with many children, but God also blessed Rachel. And, and, and we're going to see just... Th these differences between these characters but again remember that the woman's primarily j primary job during this time time period was to have children for her husband because it was good for the community but it was good for the family okay which leads us actually very closely again remember the uh, the the job of the woman was to have children for her husband the problem the problem that we see so frequently is that they don't have paternity tests back in the day. They weren't able, uh, you know, to take a DNA sample of your child and say, hey, this kid belongs to this man. This child is, uh, you know, is, is being fathered by his re real father. What was common during this time period was adultery. And it's not to say that adultery doesn't occur now, but I want you to, to realize that the rate of adultery back in the day, back in the times of ancient Israel, was probably close to the, the rate of adultery now. Something that we forget is, is that sin is sin. sin. The nature of sin is throughout time and history. It's throughout human history, at least. It's not like nowadays people are more licentious. It's not like nowadays people are more carnal. No, people have always been carnal. People have always been adulterers. They've always, you know, slept around and, and had multiple partners and, and, and done this, this and that thing. In early Hebrew culture, again, because the family unit is so important, adultery was punishable by death because there's no way to prove, there's no way to prove whose child that is. There's no way to prove who's who's the father of this child. So let me let me let me like read this paragraph and explain it to you in, in depth. So adultery was punishable by death, and infidelity by the husband was not considered a crime unless it was with a married woman. So let me say that one more time. It, it's just to, to get you to un, to get you to just get the context of this. Adultery was punishable by death for the woman. See, an infidelity. By the husband was not considered a crime unless it was with a married woman. Uh, something really important is, is that there's a difference between adultery and fornication. Uh, again, I, I hope this isn't uh, you know going on too sensitive of ears. But adultery being um, kind of a, a man and a woman who who were basically 
you know, marry, they're both separately married to different couples. And if a married man and a married woman had an adulterous relationship, right, then they both would be, they both would be killed. Okay. So the, the husband, the husband of a wife and the, the, the married woman, if they got into relations, uh, that is, is when adultery is punished, punished by death. But infidelity that when a married man uh, has sex with a non-married woman, it was just frowned upon. It wasn't punished by death. And so this is something that I, I hope you, you kind of uh, wrap your heads around. If it's a married man and a married woman and both are married and they both are found um, you know, in, this, in this adulterous relationship, then they're both killed. Again, this is for the sake of the community because what happens is if a married woman is, is having sex with a married man, then what happens is, is that the, the, the married woman, whose children is she rearing? If she has a child, then there is this speculation. There is a speculation. Is that man? Is, is that man the rightful father of this, of this child? Or is the husband of the woman the rightful father? the rightful father of this child. It had incredible implications because of the way inheritance worked. The way of, of how you pass down your possessions unto your children is, is that if, if I am a married man and I, and I, have, and I have relations with a, another married woman, regardless, regardless of uh, my desires, of, of what I want to do, of who I want to give my money to, it's required that I give my, in, my, my land and my money once I die. It's required it goes to my children. Again, there's no paternity test. There's no way to prove it. And so the laws were there in place to protect this. The laws were in, in, in place to protect the lineage of who is the father of who. That there's no, there's no confusion. But again, infidelity uh, of, of a man having sex with an unmarried woman uh, if she was unmarried, it was just frowned upon. It wasn't, it wasn't that big of a deal. So if found to have committed fornication, which is sex before marriage, the man would, is required to marry the woman. And then if a woman was found to commit fornication and the man said, I don't want to marry you, she was to be killed. Sounds crazy. It's, it's very difficult to, um, yeah, it's very difficult to grasp, but that is just the laws of the time. So hopefully that, that kind of has you understand, uh, really, the women get the short end of the stick in terms of the laws, but that's just the way the laws worked. And the, the last law that's important to understand as we get into this all is that prostitution was tolerated, but prostitutes were outcasts. Prostitution was not a profession that, was, uh, that you would be killed for. Um, many times we'll see this with Judah and Tamar. Uh, we'll see this throughout just, I mean, even today, we'll, we're talking about Rahab and she was a harlot or a prostitute. Uh, prostitution during this time period uh, was a, a profession. It was something that women, uh, unmarried women, were able to do to make a living. And so perhaps, you know, you were, you were caught being a fornicator and they were going to execute you and instead you're just like, I'm just going to be a prostitute. This will be my job. And my job will be uh, be this this kind of, of profession. So hopefully, again, I'm just trying to lay down the framework of the context of the laws during this time period. So our first our first dive into the study of the women of the Bible has to go into the study of Eve. Um, we'll most likely talk about Eve throughout this entire study. Um, Eve is, is such a crucial character because more than any story of the Bible, as we were, as I was mentioning before with that, even that question of, is Eve this evil temptress, this, this temptress that is going to, um, you know, cause the original sin that this story has been used as a theological basis for sexism. And I, and again, I'm not trying to say the church is sexist. I'm not trying to say anyone is sexist or, or, or any of y'all are sexist. None of y'all are sexist. It's, it's okay. Don't, don't worry. This is an attack on you. But in terms of a character that has been used as a way to push down women as second class citizens to continue this trend, uh, to validate the cultural aspect of sexism or of, of the second class citizen of women, Eve has been used because she has been portrayed as being this evil temptress. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, 
It says, then the Lord God said to, uh, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So again, this is Genesis. Uh, just, just I didn't write that down, but hopefully you, you get that. So in Genesis chapter 2, God looks at man and he says, it's not good for him to be alone. I'm going to make a helper fit for him. The, the key word that is uh, that we are going to look at right now, let me see if I can get a highlighter, is this word helper. Okay, so there are so many different types of interpretations that we can take for this this word. Uh, one one of them is a helper. Others are companions. Uh, someone is like some basically say that it's it's basically someone who is a partner. Um, so regardless of, regardless of how you interpret this word, the word really is is just helper. Uh, it is is someone to support. Uh, someone to support him, someone to be with him. Regardless of how you interpret this word, uh, what's important is to understand the reason why man was not just man, that man and woman were created. And and I want to get a little bit deeper into this as we go on to this into the studies. But something that's that's uh, that I don't necessarily agree with um, is is the idea that women came from man uh, one of the things that has has uh, been taught or just just this idea is that because god made women out of the rib of man that it's man who gave birth to women no i i just disagree with that i don't think women came from man women came from god Women were created by God. The first woman was not birthed by Adam. Adam Adam did not decide one day, I am going to replicate or I'm going to birth this woman. He didn't decide, you know, and, and, and he didn't reproduce himself. And so therefore women came out of man due to man's own volition. Rather, it is God who is making Hopefully you're following with me here. And again, I'm I'm sure this is where if I could see everyone, you know, there's these question marks. Man did not decide to have women, but God decided to make women out of man. And so he chose to take the rib out of the man to form the woman that to show their interconnectedness, how close they were, that they were, you know, of the same flesh, of the same body. But what is not good is to think, okay, the man is first. And therefore, the man was created first, and God was like, man, the man is good. And, and the man is the best. But you know what? He needs a second place. And, and the man needs a second place, someone to come right under him, right beneath him, to grovel at his feet. And so, the man will create the woman. And the, and the woman is going to be sub- subject over to this man for all of eternity. No. No. Okay, I, I don't think that that's the case. I think more than anything, the question that arises is the gender of God. The, and again, hopefully that makes you feel a little comfortable because God doesn't have a gender. The gender of God, perhaps, perhaps, the gender of God is more understood, is better understood in both man and woman, not just man. And, and maybe that's what God was getting at this. See, God is making man and he's saying man should not be alone because God isn't even alone. God exists in Trinity. God exists in relationship. And so God is saying it is not good for this man to be alone. And so I'm going to better reflect what I look like. I'm going to better reflect who I am because the man is a man. He, he is this man. He is, he is this, this testosterone-filled man. But that's not even me. That's not even who I am as God. My characteristic isn't just as a man. And so I'm going to make a helper for him. And and it's this woman. So the other time we see this word helper, again, and, and just the word helper, um, this comforter. I hope, I hope it helps you, it, it makes you think of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is is this helper. And I think one of the most interesting things in a Trinitarian study is that it's not all about God the Father. It's not even all about God the Son. That there is this third person of the Trinity that if you grieve the third person of the Trinity, it is the unforgivable sin. 
and and I don't know I don't know what necessarily you're going to draw from that because again the idea of an, uh, the unforgivable sin that's a whole Bible study in and of itself but the fact that that's even there that there is an unforgivable sin and it is grieving the Comforter it is grieving the Helper it is grieving the Holy Spirit. I, I think it's very important to understand that when we talk about our Trinitarian God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are equal. That it is not God the Father who is more important than God the Holy Spirit. And it is not God the Son who is more important than God the Holy Spirit. That they are equal in importance. They are just different in function. They are different in role. And so, again, maybe this is, where, this is really where I begin to divert away from the feminists. This is where I divert away from uh, even egalitarians in certain ways and I fall more into the complementarian camp is, is that there are different functions of men and women. There are different functions. There are different roles for men and women. It doesn't mean that women cannot be pastors. It doesn't mean that women cannot preach or teach. But what I think is, is that there still is a biological difference between men and women. And that's not something that should make women feel any lesser. That should not make men feel any more superior that women and men have different roles. But this is what we've done as sin. Is even when we read this, that man should not be alone, I will make a helper for him. What we think, oh, God made Adam, Eve, his secretary. God made Eve the assistant. He made Eve the receptionist. Adam's the boss. He's the one sitting in the corner office. And Eve is the helper. He's the, she's the one managing his calendar. She's the one managing all his meetings. And we make it, we make it disrespectful towards Eve. So next up. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. And so we see, So when the woman saw that a tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So this is, uh, again, the story of Adam, uh, of Adam and Eve. And, and again, I skipped over the part with the serpent and, and just that conversation. Um, again, I, I can go into more depth over this later. I, I, I will. Well, again, I'm, I'm saying we will go back and, and revisit uh, the relationship between Adam and Eve. But this passage... This passage, so much blame was placed on Eve. But let me let me go to the next um, the next passage. Verse three eleven, uh, I mean chapter three, verse eleven says, "He said, or God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat?" The man said, "The woman you, uh, whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate." Uh, okay, so the reason why I want to bring this up. These two, these two passages, and I have one more after this, um, but the reason why I want to bring this up is, again, it, it describes to me, it, it shows to me the beginnings of this differentiation between the genders, at least in their roles and their functions, um, and the failure of, of these roles and these functions. This isn't, again, to say that women should not be in leadership, that women should not be in charge. I, I, I'm not saying that whatsoever. But in this specific relationship, in this specific marriage between Adam and Eve, Adam was the one that was told to be in charge. Right? He was the one that was created, that his call, and again, this is not to say that all men are called to the call of Adam. That is not what I'm saying. In this specific relationship between this husband and this wife, Adam was called to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? Eve was not given that call. And, and I, maybe this is something that, that many of you ha just need to go back and read the book of Genesis. And we'll go over this in a future lesson. Eve was never told by God to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That command was given to Adam before Eve was created. Before Eve was created, God told Adam, "Do not you can eat of any tree of the fruit of a uh, tree or fruit of the trees in the, of the garden except the one in the center. That one you are prohibited from eating. If you eat it that day you shall you shall surely die." He told that to Adam. So the call of Adam, specifically this Adam, was to tend the trees in the garden, to tend the animals, to take care of everything, but don't eat that tree. That was his call. But what we see is that he 
taught Eve incorrectly. And so even the way Eve talks to the serpent, she misquotes God. She misquotes perhaps her husband. I mean, she misquotes God in, in his instructions. And she says, even if I touch it, I'll die. You know, even if I go near it, I'll die. You know, even if I, it, it, it's just, I just don't even want to be near this at all. But the serpent says, no, if you touch it, you won't die. If anything, if you eat it, you'll be like God. And that's, that's why he doesn't want you to eat it. Adam, during this entire process that Eve is talking to the serpent, he's right there. Let me, let me, let me, let me go back. Um, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. While Eve is talking to the serpent... And again, Eve is misquoting God. She is she she wasn't there. She didn't get the call from God to not eat of this tree. Um, so she was just talking to the serpent, and Adam was just kind of silently sitting in the background. He was just quietly sitting back and seeing his wife talk to the serpent. He's there and he's just watching her. And he's just like, Oh, what is she gonna do? Is she gonna eat it? Oh, I kinda wanna eat it too. And what happens is is that in this in this situation, Adam failed. Adam was supposed to take the role and say, hey, 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 Eve, Eve, let me protect you right now. Let me help you and understand that this serpent doesn't know what he's talking about. God told me not to eat of this tree. I don't care what this serpent says. We need to not eat of this tree. And then God confronts the man and the man, the man, Adam fails. He, he messes up a lot because what does he do when God confronts him? God confronts, not Eve. He doesn't say Eve messed up. Okay, again, I'm not, I'm not even saying that Eve didn't mess up. She did mess up. But God goes to Adam and says, what did you do? Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Didn't I command you, Adam, not to eat of this tree? And Adam does the worst thing he could do. The woman. The woman. She made me do it. She made me do it. And this is what has caused so much trouble in the area of making the Bible seem to be this sexist document, to be this sexist, sexist text, is that Adam blames the woman. He blames the woman. And you know what? That is despicable. That is terrible. That is not acceptable. Adam should have said, God, it's on me. I failed. I messed up. I, I shouldn't have eaten of the tree. You told me not to eat of the tree and I ate of the tree. I messed up. I'm sorry. I repent. But he didn't repent. He blamed. Okay. So this is, this is kind of where I want to get to this. Jesus is, is told to us in the New, New Testament. Uh, he's compared to being the second Adam. And I'm sure you've heard, you've heard of this. And, and what I love about the idea of Jesus as the second Adam is that he really is this true leader. He is this leader that is willing to lay down his life for us. He's willing, even though we messed up, he, he says, you know, take me instead. How much better would Adam have been if after Eve ate of the tree, that Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam said, Lord, my wife has, has failed. My wife has sinned and eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Instead of punishing her, Lord, punish me. Punish me. Take me instead. And, and, and that if Adam did what his role as the leader was, was is to be the servant. See, the, the, the way that leadership is described in the Bible is we see it through Christ is that a true leader is a true servant. That Jesus being the head of the church is a servant to the church. But here's the, here's the twist that I guess I'm, I'm adding. I don't, I don't know. Maybe this is just uh, heretical. But Mary is the second Eve. Because Mary is this true servant. And I, what I mean by this is that Mary, when she was told by the angel that she was going to, that she was going to be pregnant with Jesus, um, she gives the most brave, the most faithful response. And, and she basically says, Lord, I'm your humble servant. Do what you want. Do what you wish with me. Um, Mary, Mary does something that is the most womanly thing, uh, the most feminine thing you can do the most subord uh, submissive and yet subordinate, but submissive thing that you can do. And she said, Lord, I'm your humble servant. Do what you want with me. And, and, and the reason why I, I think that this is um, a good reminder that Jesus is the second Adam and, and Mary being the second Eve, again, that's kind of, I, I, I hold that with a grain of salt. All I mean to say is, is that we do see a better depiction of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And, and ah, if I could really have you understand this, I want you to see that they are very similar. 
that they're not that different because being a true leader like Jesus is being a true servant. So being a true servant is really being a true leader. So Mary is a leader. Mary was a leader. She was such a leader that she came before Jesus. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get you to understand that the equality between men and women is so much closer in the Bible than when we, the, what we actually take it for face value. Again, Jesus was a leader by being a servant. Mary was a servant and therefore she was a leader. Uh, again, maybe, maybe this is just going to go over your head. I can't, even, I can't even really interact with you very well right here. But what I want you to understand is, is that the depictions of men and women in the Bible isn't so far off from being equal. Okay, so we get into Rahab. And this is going to be a, a relatively short section um, but I, I want I want to uh, I, I love Rahab. I think Rahab is such an awesome character in the Bible. She's so great. Uh, so Joshua chapter two, Joshua. So let me just uh, remind you of what Joshua chapter two says. Joshua sends out two spies into the land of Jericho. Uh, the spies stay at the home of Rahab, the prostitute. Even though the king of Jericho told her to bring the men out, she hid them. And, and it's this hiding them and basically saying, like, please save me and my family um, because and we're going to read. We'll read a section of chapter 2 just to, to go over what Rahab really said. So Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. Before the men lay down, she came uh, up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea uh, before you when you came out of Egypt and what you, what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who are beyond the Jordan, up to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that I, as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will sa save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. So Rahab, and I underline a few, a few portions, but Rahab is a woman of faith. She is this awesome woman of faith. And it's not just a faith of a woman. It's just faith. Like she has great faith because she, she says these things about Yahweh, about God. How she heard these stories of what God has done. That God is the one that gave them the land. And she's like, I, I know your God is the real God. For, your, for the Lord, your God, he is the God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. She is, she is talking more like a Jewish person even though she is a pagan. She is someone who lives in Jericho. Uh, she is, is not of this religion, but she is seeing what God is doing. She's heard the stories of God parting the Red Sea. She heard the stories of their victory. Uh, throughout the land of the Amorites. She's like, your God is real. And what we'll see is that this is the basis of faith. It's not where you come from. It's not your culture. It's not your gender. It is the fact that you believe what God has done. What I love about the Bible, what I love about the Bible is that <sighs> Rahab was a harlot. Okay, Rahab was a harlot and rarely throughout, throughout any of, of texts, even today, rarely is a harlot, a prostitute, the hero of the story. Rahab was a harlot, but so was Israel. And this is so important for us to connect. Rahab kept her promises and was faithful. So, so should Israel. If they were faithful and, their, and they and their families would also be allowed to partake in the promise as did Rahab and her family. Okay, you have to understand the significance of this. The fact that Joshua, the book of Joshua, is using a prostitute as a hero, as a, a savior of sorts of the Israelites is so progressive, is so insane. Because why would you, first of all, use a woman as the protagonist of a story? And secondly, why would this protagonist of, of a woman be a prostitute you're you're picking basically the two the two most uh i guess the lowest forms in their society in in their culture to be a woman as well as to be a prostitute you're talking about the bottom of the barrel why would you make why god why would you why would you allow this woman to be the hero of the story because god is saying y'all don't get it you guys are the harlot that israel the small nation that you are 
You guys are the prostitute. And if you have the same faith as Rahab, I will save you as well. Because your faith is not based on your actions. Your faith is based on what you believe. And your faith is based on who you believe I am as the Lord your God. Israel is always successful when they remember what God has done in the past. Israel is always successful when they remember God is the God who saved us from Egypt. God is the God who saved us through all these time periods. That's why Passover is so important for them to observe every single year is because they recognize, they recognize, God, we did nothing. You did everything. Rahab recognized, God, your God does everything. He's the real God and therefore just save me. And God saves her and her family. Which leads me into our final kind of character um, in, in today's lesson. It's the character of Hosea. So I don't know if you've heard the book of Hosea. Uh, if you if you can go back and read just that book, it's a relatively short, but it's it's a deep one. It's very deep and it's very like shocking. Um, but Hosea and Gomer are a real life metaphor for the relationship between God and Israel. Hosea was commanded by God to marry a promiscuous woman, a prostitute named Gomer, to show the con covenantal relationship between God and Israel. Okay. Israel doesn't really get this very often. They don't understand. They don't really let it sink into them that God views them as a prostitute. It doesn't sink well with them because who wants to be like, yeah, I'm a prostitute. <laughs> like God, God sees our country, God sees our nation, and He's like, you're you're a prostitute. You are you are uh, you know sleeping around with a bunch of other gods and. You know, how dare you? How dare you? And I'm going to punish you for your sins of being a prostitute. No one wants, no one wants that. Like no one wants to think, you know, America, if someone called America a prostitute, that doesn't feel very good. It doesn't feel, if someone said South Korea is a prostitute, you know, and, and it's like, no, I'm not, we're not prostitutes. We're, we're good. We're good people. You know, we're, we're great. We're, we're, we, we do really well. Uh, we're not prostitutes. We're just, you know, not that great, but we're not prostitutes. God specifically correlates Israel with a prostitute. And, and what he tells Hosea is so profound. He says, go marry her. Go enter into a covenantal relationship with this promiscuous woman. And love her. Cherish her. Be with her unconditionally. That no matter what she does, and, and Gomer does go out and she does cheat on, on Hosea. Though no matter how many times she cheats on you, that you will constantly go back to her over and over again. You will forgive her time and time again. You will be faithful to her, Hosea. God is trying to say, Israel, you are this harlot. And as long as, as long as we have this covenantal relationship, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Again, it's not to put down women. If anything, it, it tries to say, Israel, all these men, you know, all these, all these Pharisees, all these people who think they're so religious. No, you are a harlot. You are, you are this woman. You, again, I don't know, I don't know how, how they would have taken it, but if Jesus the Pharisees, <laughs> to the Pharisees, told the Pharisees, you guys are prostitutes because you worship other gods other than the, the one true God. I don't know how, I, I think the, pro, the, the Pharisees wouldn't have taken that very well. But that's basically what the book of Hosea is saying to the nation of Israel. You are prostitutes, but I'm going to be faithful to you no matter what. <clears throat> so as, um, as we close and, and, just, just for all of you to, um, before we, before I close in prayer, again, this was just the intro um, of of the study. I have so much more to say about the role of of women um, in in the church and in, in the Bible, uh, talking about just what it means to be a woman, what it means to, um, yeah, what 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 this all means. And, and I'm hoping I'm hoping that as as we go through the study. Uh, that we, we do have a time for question and answer. We do have a time for interaction because I may be wrong. Again, I'm just trying to read the Bible, read these stories and, and just look through the lens of these female characters. And, and again, we'll, we can go back to old characters and, and go through these stories. But I just pray and I hope that this will um, not make us feminists. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to show us that we are all God's creation. We are all created in his image and we all bring something to the table. And so I, I do not want to... Uh, you know, skip over these these stories too quickly, uh, and so before we get into a time of question and answer, let's let's close or let's close this section in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for blessing us with these stories of these these amazing women, 
uh, God, and, and even though we give Eve so much, gr uh, so much grief, um, so much flack for eating of the, the tree, Lord, I also, um, Lord, I just say that you would, you would also have us understand that Adam was just as guilty, that both Adam and Eve were guilty of sinning. Um, and Lord, I pray that as uh, we go through our lives, that we don't do what Adam did and just blame and just point the finger and say it was her fault. And, and Lord, instead, we would just understand, um, we would understand that you are a forgiving God, that if we turn and we repent and we uh, own up to our sins, that you are quick to forgive. Lord, I pray that you would make us like Jesus, that we would be true leaders by being servants and laying down our lives for for our families, for the ones we love, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would lay down our lives for you and that we would be like Mary um, in the sense that we would be true servants, that even if you say the craziest thing, that we would say, yes, Lord, do what you will with me, that we would be true servants uh, in our faith to you. Father, I pray that you would help us to be like Rahab, uh, that we would not see our faith being dependent on our gender, our faith being dependent on our nationality or our culture, but our faith would be dependent on our belief of what you've done. And Father, help us to understand your covenantal love for us, your commitment to us, uh, that no matter what, unconditionally you will be with us uh, through, throughout the ages. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.